The thing I would point out is that um, there are bull markets and bear markets and uh, in basically any tradable instrument or commodity or uh, I consider gold to be a form of money. But what we're really talking about when we say, you know, gold is up, what we're talking about the dollar price of gold. And I view it as a cross exchange rate. People talk about the dollar, you know, the euro dollar exchange rate. Well, there's a dollar gold exchange rate and that's the dollar price of gold. Uh, so there's just alternative forms of money where people get to express a liquidity preference or uh, a credit preference, if you will, if you're concerned about the, um, if you're losing confidence in the dollar. But the first great bull market was um, 1971 to 1980. Uh, it lasted nine years and gold went up 2,000 200 um, percent. The second great bull market was from uh, 1999 to 2011. Gold went up at just a little under 700 uh, percent. But um, in between, you had a bear market from 1980 to 1999. It's a long one, uh, you know, almost 20 years. Gold dropped from $800 to $250 at the bottom in 1999. And we had a second bear market starting in 2011. Now, I had a very interesting conversation with uh, Jim Rogers. Um, you know, Jim is one of the great commodity traders, uh, money managers of all times. And um, we were down in the uh, Dominican Republic at the Casa de Campa. This is around 2014. But, you know, the, the bear market started in 2011, but it really fell off a cliff in 2013. So I said, Jim, you know, what, what do you think of gold? What are you doing? He goes, well, I own it, of course. And he said, I'm not selling, but I'm not buying right here. And he said something that just hit me right between the eyes and it stayed with me. And of course, he's right. He said, gold's going to the moon, but nothing goes to the moon without a 50% correction along the way. And if you look at the high in 2011, $1,900, you know, approximately, and where was the bottom of the of the bear market? It was $1,050 on December 16, 2015. Nobody knew it was the bottom at the time. But if you look at that drop down and you, you use $250 as your base, because you know you need a base. So you had uh, basically a uh, 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 the run from 250 to 1900 uh, was $1,750. Go down 50% from there, it's $825. 1900 minus 825 is 1075, and the bottom was 1050. So, so Jim totally stuck the landing. Like a 1050, like, okay, there's your 50% retracement. Now that's the bottom. Now it's going up, and the sky's the limit. Well, we're not overheated at all. And I've got gold at, uh, I would put it at $15,000 an ounce before 2025. But as I point out, if you're going to $15,000 an ounce, you got to get to 3,000, 5,000, 7,000 first. So there's plenty of room to run, plenty of room for profits. But you know, when I say things like that, I want to be clear, there's a lot of analysis behind it. I don't just pull a big number out of the air and you know for publicity because I could care less. But if you just took the average, and there are a couple ways to think about it. Just take the average of the two prior bull markets I mentioned. So 71 to 80, nine years, 2,200%. 99 to 2011, a 12-year bull market, um, about 700%. Just take the average. You don't have to go to the higher of the two or extrapolate. Just take the average of those two bull markets. You would say, okay, well, the, the next bull market is going to be a little over 10 years, and it's going to go up. Um, it's, it's going to go up 1,500%. So using that as your base, just take the average of the two. You say, all right, 10 years from 2015, that puts you out to 2025, and at you know 1,400%, it puts you at $15,000 an ounce off a 1050 base. So so that's just that's just history. But there are other ways to think about it. Now, um, you know, I don't know if there'll be a gold standard or not, but I do know that gold will move. The price of gold will move in the direction of where it would need to be if you're going to have a gold standard. And you know, I talked to Paul Volcker about this, and and he agreed. You, um, uh, if you just took the money supply, so just take M M1, which is you know pretty widely accepted definition of uh, money supply. Take it for the U.S. the ECB. UK, Bank of Japan, and People's Bank of China. There are other entities you could include, but that's that's about that's over 75% of global GDP right there. Uh, divide that number by the official goal, which is about 34,000 metric tons, a little bit less. You come to $15,000 an ounce. So uh, if you're if you're going to either have a gold standard or even use gold as a reference point for money, uh, if you if you need to restore confidence in the dollar, the implied non-deflationary price is fifteen thousand dollars now. So what I find interesting is that if you use the just the history of the last two bull markets and average them, or if you use you know a rigorous calculation, what's the what's the implied non-deflationary price? 
Interestingly, they come out in the same place. I don't think they have to. They're two different methods, but they both point to $15,000 an ounce sometime over the next three or four years. If it is a moving target, the numbers I gave you are based on current levels, but if you keep printing money, you need a higher price to, if you want to reference gold and not cause deflation, which they don't, you're going to need a progressively higher price of gold. One thing people forget, um, you know, they tend they look at the dollar price in absolute dollars. So it went up $100 an ounce, or, you know, I expect before long it'll go up $1,000 an ounce a week. But each dollar increase is a smaller percentage increase. So people look at the dollar, yeah, it's real money, it's nice to make the money. But, you know, if you go from, uh, $14,000 an ounce to $15,000 an ounce, that's only a 7% increase. I mean, that's you can do that in a week. So so my point is, it's still $1,000 an ounce, good for the holders, but the, the percentage increase gets smaller and smaller as the absolute dollar amount gets larger and larger. So $15,000 sounds like a big number from today's perspective, but as you go to 10, 11, 12, it gets to be a progressively smaller percentage increase and therefore more likely. You really, you need to see it logarithmically to see it, you know, a less hyperbolic curve. So logarith logarithmically is the right way to think about it, but in dollar terms, the percentage increase gets to be pretty small at those levels. And uh, when I say $15,000 now, I don't think I'm stretching. I mean, could, could it be 25,000, 40,000? I mean, just take my, my monetary equivalent. If you use M2, and by the way, my when I said, when I used M1 and did that math, that's with 40% backing, because historically 40% has been a high level of backing. If you take M2 at 100% backing, you get to 50,000 an ounce in a heartbeat. My numbers, I think, are conservative. They could be much higher. But the thing I would point out is that the, the Fed dug a hole and they can't get out of it. And I said in, uh, you know, well, all along, but certainly, you know, 2014, 2015, et cetera, as they did the taper and then they did the liftoff and then they raised rates and all that. I said, the Fed is trying to get out of this. They're trying to normalize the balance sheet, trying to normalize interest rates. But I also said they won't be able to do it. And that's exactly what happened in the fourth quarter of 2018 between October 1st and December um, uh, 24th, 2018, the stock market dropped 19%. It was one point away from a bear market at that stage. And then you had the Christmas Eve massacre. And that's when Jay Powell threw in the towel. He got religion. He said, okay, first he said, we're not going to raise rates anymore. Then he said, we're on pause. Then he said, we're actually going to cut rates. And then nine months later, he said, we're going to and quantitative tightening, which was reducing the balance, the, the, the money supply. And then in September uh, 2019, they started QE4, which is the, that was before any of the, before the recession, before the depression, before the pandemic, they were already in QE4 and uh, cutting rates again. So th they can't get out of it, now it's worse. So they prove that the, the failure is manifest, they prove that they can't get out of it, uh, and, what, and, and, and what can they do? By the way, on, on monetary theory, I mean, they so say, what's the secret behind mon I think it's garbage, by the way, but you so say, what's the secret behind it? Well, the secret behind it is, if you can issue debt and collect taxes in the money that you print, you can force people to accept the money because they need the money to pay their taxes. And if they don't pay the taxes, they end up in jail. Now you can, you can, you know, get extensions or you know do whatever. But at the end of the day, if you manifestly refuse to pay your taxes, they will come and uh, and put you in jail. And and the point is, it relies on state power. It's really a neo-fascist concept. It relies on coercion, you know, the point of a gun, jails, and state power to enforce the confidence in money. Now that's, and they say that. I mean, I've, I've read Stephanie Kelton, she's the bright light. I mean, this goes back a long way, but I've met her, read her books and, and uh, her book, I should say, and her articles. Uh, but they're very explicit about that. Now, I think that's completely wrong because there are so many workarounds and so many ways to get out from under that kind of state power, but they do rely on state power at the end of the day. So that's why it has this, this neo-fascist element the Fed will not be able to get interest rates to 5% without causing recession, not to mention the impact on the deficit and a lot of other things. So the Fed can't escape the room. So if inflation stays where it is, the Fed can't get interest rates to a real level uh, without causing recession, which will sink the stock market. But if even if inflation comes down a little bit, that'll be a sign of recession. So you're raising rates into a recession, which will cause a recession. You end up in a recession either way. Um, it's just a question of whether the Fed persists or throws in the towel. Now, we've seen this movie before. What's going on is an exact replay 
of what happened between 2013 and 2019. May 2013, Bernanke announces the taper. Expectation is they're going to start the taper in September. He chickens out. They start the taper in November 2013. They finish the taper in November 2014. Then here comes Yellen. and she's going to raise rates. Take out the word patient from the, from the statement. She doesn't raise rates until December 2015. And then she doesn't raise them again until December 2016. They went a whole year between two 25 basis point rate cuts. And then here comes Powell and then boom, okay, 25 basis points, boom, boom, boom. Gets them up to two and a quarter, which is where they want it to be. and gets the balance sheet down to eh, about three and a half trillion. They want to get it down to about two and a half trillion. But he's, he's got rates about where he wants them. He's got the balance sheet on its way down uh, and uh, he's normalizing. And what happens? The stock market crashes 20% between October 1st, 2018 and December 24th, 2018. That was the famous Christmas Eve massacre where the stock market fell 3% in one day. But the Fed still tightening. The Fed tightened like a week before the Christmas Eve massacre. They tightened into the weakness. They were getting very close to crashing the stock market. They took it down 20% in three months, getting close to crashing. So what happens next? First week of January, Powell comes out. Okay, we're not going to raise interest rates anymore. We're going to be patient. They use all these code words. We're going to be patient. Then he starts cutting rates. Then he starts QE. I forget if it was eight or nine, whatever. Lost, lost track of QE. He starts QE8, let's say. And then that takes you into 2020. And here comes the pandemic. And rates go down to zero. And the balance sheet goes to $7 trillion. They were back where they were in May of 2013 except worse, because now the balance sheet was even bigger than it was then. A complete failure. So who thinks they're going to be more successful this time? They're doing the same thing. It's going to happen faster this time because the market saw that whole seven-year fiasco from May to 2013 to May 2020, a seven-year round-trip failure. The same thing's going to happen, but it's going to happen faster this time because like, the market knows that the Fed doesn't know what they're doing. So the Fed's tightening into weakness. One of two things is going to happen. And it's not clear which, but it's going to be one or the other. They're going to keep tightening and keep tightening and keep tightening and try to get a handle on inflation and crash the stock market. Or they're going to lose their nerve, back off on the tightening, and then inflation is just going to rip, which will also crash the stock market. So take your pick, but um, it's going to be one or the other. But this idea of a soft landing is nonsense. The 2021 thesis was that, you know, inflation grew. Part of it was base effects because, you know, the, the way the government calculates inflation, it's monthly data compared to the year before. So it's year over year, monthly, then annualized. Uh, and so one could easily explain inflation in April, May, June 2021 because you were comparing it to 2020, which was the worst recession since 1946. But the base effects would run off uh, in September, October, November. But the inflation persisted, even though the base effects were gone. So now it's like, okay, this is real inflation. It's coming from somewhere else. It was coming from the supply chain, which the Fed can't do anything about either because the Fed doesn't drill for oil. They don't build pipelines and they don't grow wheat. The Fed can't do anything about any of those things. And that's where um, the war and the sanctions and the continuation of COVID played a role. So, you know, I say you can, you can have your own uh, views, but you can't have your own data. The data is clear. The inflation is here. The supply chains are getting worse. But these supply chain disruptions didn't start with the war. They didn't even start with the pandemic. They started with Trump's trade war beginning in 2018. I found a very good book on that uh, written by um, uh, Lorian LaRocco. Uh, and what's interesting about her book is that she finished it in late 2019. So it's almost like a controlled experiment. It was pre-pandemic. It's easy to say that the pandemic disrupted the supply chain, which it did. And the war disrupted the supply chain, which it did. But here we have a very rigorous study of what was happening to supply chains before either one. And the answer is they were a mess. They were a mess back then because of tariffs on China and China redirecting soybean purchase orders from the United States to Brazil. That sounds easy because Brazil grows soybeans. Well, guess what? You got to get the ships to Brazilian ports. You got to rearrange all the logistics lanes. That was happening already. Pandemic made it worse. And now the war makes it uh, even worse than that. Yeah, the world is breaking up. Uh, we're decoupling. We're globalization is over. There'll be a new form of it. Uh, it's not the end of world trade, but you're going to see, you know, maybe the, the five eyes, you know, UK, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and friends in Western Europe form uh, a new trading block, but exclude China and Russia. It'll be a little bit more like the Cold War. I talked to Paul Walker about this, but here's what happened in the 70s. Now, it started as cost push inflation. It was the Arab oil embargo in 1973 after the 1973 war, the Israel Arab war. Uh, then the Arabs threw the embargo on us. 
the price of oil quadrupled. It went from $3 a barrel to $12 a barrel. It sounds cheap, but it's a 300% increase. And then uh, we had a severe stock market crash and recession in 1974, which at the time was the worst since the Great Depression. We've had worse ones since, but at the time that was the worst recession since the Great Depression. Then we come out of that and then along comes the Fed, you know, and um, we went off the gold standard. Nixon uh, had an easy monetary policy in 72. It was a little earlier for his reelection effort, et cetera. So here comes the inflation. But what happened along the way, and then you had another Arab oil, actually an Iranian oil embargo in 1979 after the Ayatollah took over. So there were there were double oil shocks. That was a supply-driven cost push inflation. But along the way, it morphed into demand pull. It, it morphed into a demand-driven inflation. Now, I lived through it. I mean, I was a young up-and-coming lawyer at Citibank and a senior officer living in New York City. And that was the world where if you wanted anything, new furniture, TV set, vacation, whatever, you ran out, you dropped everything, ran out and did it because the price was going up so fast. So that's instructive in two ways. Number one, um, it shows that the Fed's always behind the curve. It shows that these things can persist a lot longer than people expect. But in my view, most importantly, because I think things are going to happen more quickly now, it shows inflation morphing from cost push to demand pull, morphing from something on the supply side to a psychological shift on the consumer side. And Volcker crushed it, but um, at a huge cost. Unemployment was uh, about 11 percent. He took interest rates to 20 percent. How does that feel? You know, mortgagors and student loan holders and uh, others, you know, 20 percent. You're talking about 40 percent on credit cards in that world. And people forget, you know, well, does inflation, don't you have high growth or whatever, at least a low unemployment? No, we had stagflation. We had inflation and high unemployment. There were three recessions between 1974 and 1982. We had three, 1974, 1980 and 1981, which lasted until 1982. And by the way, uh, people lost confidence in the dollar. In the late 70s, Jimmy Carter's treasury issued what they call Carter bonds. The U.S. treasury issued debt in Swiss francs. Now, it was treasury debt. You had the treasury credit, but it was denominated in Swiss francs because nobody wanted dollars. That's how bad things were. The narrow uh, focus I'd like to start with, since it's the topic of the day, is the dollar Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I'm going to throw red meat to the wolves here by uh, citing a headline across Bloomberg earlier from Larry Summers talking about how the dollar can continue to move higher because the U.S. has all these great fundamental advantages. This comes, you know, 24 hours after another Bloomberg headline talked about the unstoppable strength in the dollar. So there's the red meat for you, and I'll let you gnaw on that for a little bit. Well, it may come as a surprise. I think I think Larry Summers was half right, and I've, I've met him a number of times. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy. He's always, I, I, uh, I almost always agree with his analysis and then disagree with his policy. So I always have to stop halfway right with Larry Summers. Like, good analysis, Larry, but you're you're going going the wrong way. Um, but yeah, I think he's right that the dollar will get strong. Uh, is probably correct. Also, where I disagree, and this is critical, is the reason why. The dollar is getting stronger for some very bad reasons, meaning bad in terms of the macro economy, what's what probably lies ahead, what is probably telling us. Um, So let's just maybe step back and not be Larry Summers for a minute, but just be everyday investors and asset allocators and analysts and and say, um, and I hate to use the word conundrum because Greenspan used it, but conundrum is a fancy way of saying I don't really understand what's going on. But um, but this is a conundrum for a lot of people because they look at it, the U.S. objectively, okay, our, our debt to GDP ratio is over 130%, highest in U.S. history. Um, tons of research coming from, um, obviously, Ken Rogoff, but really Carmen Reinhardt, Vincent Reinhardt, and others, but many others, not just them, that says um, at those debt to GDP ratios, you um, you can't grow. Uh, you, you can maybe refinance and muddle through, but it always ends either in um, default, which is unlikely because we can print the money, that much is true, or um, extreme inflation where here's your trillion dollars back, good luck buying a loaf of bread. So we'll we'll see how that plays out, but the way it's playing out in real time is that the US economic growth is incredibly weak. So we've got high, uh, sky high debt to GDP ratio. By the way, when you look at other countries in the world, you say, okay, who who's at that lunch table, you know, 130%? The answer is Lebanon, Greece, uh, Italy, those are your 
those are your, your lunch partners, so to speak. And this not, is not like a, the scene from Animal House. Would you like to meet <laughs> yeah. Clayton, Jugdash, and Muhammad? <laughs> that's, that's a good that, that's a good comparison. Um, economic growth is weak. Uh, we're in a recession. I don't care what Janet Yellen says. I don't consider her expert on the topic, but we've had our two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. Like it or not, that's the definition of recession. Um, the fact that the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is a private group, by the way, but they're the recognized referees on recessions and recoveries. The fact that they haven't said so doesn't mean anything because they never do say so until you know nine months or a year um, after it happened. And for that matter, most recessions are two quarters, some three, some have been longer, but, but most recessions are a couple of quarters. The, the National Bureau of Economic Research usually declares a recession after it's already over. Like it started, it happened, it's over, we're in recovery. And they go, oh, by the way, we had a recession last January. Uh, okay, so they'll probably get back to us, I, I would bet heavily after the election, but um, uh -huh. we'll, 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 we'll hear from them at some point. But we're in a recession now and people say, what about the third quarter? Um, and it's interesting because I do, put some weight on the Atlanta Fed GDP now. I, I do think it's a very good tool. It, they miss sometimes, they're not always accurate, but it's the best tool out there. But very few people understand their statistical technique. Because uh, what Wall Street does, uh, you, you get a whole bunch of components uh, for GDP and they come in at different times with different lags and you add them all up and you get GDP. Um, and what Wall Street does, they look at what they have and they project all the rest based on regressions and correlations, which, you know, don't necessarily hold up. But this, okay, here's what we think, here's our forecast for third quarter GDP based on uh, projections of what we don't know. Atlanta doesn't do that. Atlanta takes what we do know, hard data, and they ask a different question. They say, what would GDP be now if this was all we had? And they put out a number, but uh, they don't guess at the stuff they don't have. And it fills in as it goes along. So it's much more Bayesian in that sense. Um, but because of, how the data comes out, the, the time sequence to which the data comes out, it typically fades as the quarter goes on. It's not because they're using a uh, bad methodology. It's just because that's how they do it. Um, and so just in the last uh, week, nine days or so, it went, you know, everyone was cheering. I think with uh, September 1st, it was 2.3%, maybe a little higher, but about 2.3%. Two days later, it was 1.6 and now it's down to 1.3 so it's following that pattern i would expect by the end of september we still got three weeks to go given what i said about how it fades it, it it doesn't have to be negative but it could very well be negative maybe three quarters of decline in gdp but whatever it is it's going to be weak so if it's positive you know two tenths or three tenths i mean that's okay but you're still rounding our away from recession it doesn't mean the problem's over so uh debt to gdp is sky high economy weak at best probably had a recession in the first half. Maybe that's continuing. Um, people talk unemployment close to an all-time low. went up a little bit in the last report. Yeah, but even at 3.5% or so, uh, that that is extremely low. I mean, I go back to the 1960s and uh, that was that was low, low by the measures of the 1960s. But that completely ignores probably eight to 10 million Americans who were, were perfectly able of having jobs and working, um, prime, you know, prime age, 25 to 54 years old, who are not in the workforce. Yeah. Um, that's that's that measure is picked up in labor force participation rate, which is uh, uh, low. I mean, that was that peaked around 70 percent in 19, sorry, in 2000, uh, main, up from the 1970s, and that was women coming into the workforce and other factors. Uh, but now it's down to around 62 percent and change it ticked up a little bit in the last report but it's still extremely low it's never 100 i mean there's always you could be um, a homemaker a, a student um they're they're uh retired early retirees there are a lot of reasons people aren't in the workforce but not you know taking 10 percent off a 14 percent decline uh from the starting place in um uh over 20 years that's uh so if you, if you throw those people into the un they're not called unemployed because they're not looking for jobs but if you threw them in, unemployment would be closer to 10%, which is a recession or a depression level, actually. Um, so, and, and I could go on, but the point is there, there are all kinds of signs of weakness. So, you know, <laughs> if we have the deficit, uh, where, um, you know, the baseline deficit is a trillion, that's before uh, an extra two trillion for Trump's COVID relief, uh, an extra two, three trillion for Biden's COVID relief, if you include the, uh, a ludicrously named Inflation Reduction Act right. uh, and, and, you know, and, and the American Rescue Act and uh, the Infrastructure Act 
call it what you want. It's it's still three to four trillion. Yeah. Two for Trump. That's six on top of two baseline. That's eight trillion dollars in two years. So your deficit's out of control, and your trade deficit's out of control. So what's not to like? Um, and yet you, you look at all that. You say, well, "What? Are you kidding me? I mean, get me out of the dollar. Get me go get anything else. Uh, why is the dollar so strong?" And the answer is, for this, you have to go behind the curtain. You have to look into the, what's called the plumbing of the international monetary system. And I had a discussion, um, and this goes back, this is 1980. Uh, so I'm a, you know, an up, young, up and coming vice president of Citibank. That's back uh, back in the days when it was a bank before they turned it into a hedge fund. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm like a 27 or whatever, a 28 maybe year old lawyer. Um, but I'm I'm talking to Walter Riston. It's you know, a one-on-one -on -one conversation. He was, mm -hmm. for those who don't know the name or don't recall, he was probably the second greatest banker of the 20th century after Pierpont Morgan. So I'll give Morgan the prize, uh, mm -hmm. but he, he left around 1910. Uh, but, um, and Riston was the inventor of the Euro dollar. Oh, oh sorry, the, the, the negotiable certificate of deposit. Euro dollars are around a little bit earlier, but he, took the CD that that represent, that was your interest in the euro dollar and made them negotiable and tradable. Um, so I'm having a conversation with him and I I had just seen this movie, which I highly recommend as Chris Christopherson, Hume Cronin and Jane Fonda. It's called Rollover. Uh, and it's again, 1980, but all star cast. Yeah, I got a murder mystery, a little sex tone in, but it's uh, it's basically about the collapse of confidence in the US dollar. And Hume mm. Cronin plays the Walter Riston part. Um, and basically the idea was the, remember this is during the, the Arab oil embargoes and the Iranian oil embargo and price of oil quadrupled in eight years and all that. So the, the theme was the, the Arabs are taking the money out of the banking system and buying gold and they're stashing the gold away. And this is the, the collapse of the financial system. And that, that was sort of the plot. So I, <laughs> I said, yeah, uh, and Mr. Riston, uh, uh, what about that? You know, everyone took their money out of the system and, uh, bought gold. Wouldn't that collapse the system? And he looked at me like I was a new kid on the block, which I was. And he said, well, what you have to understand is that you can take your money out of the bank and you can buy gold. But the person who sold you the gold got the money and they put it back in the bank. So it doesn't go anywhere. It's a closed circuit. And of course, now I'm like, oh, oh yeah, you're right. Of course, he's right. Um, and he said, so the the uh, stability of the system doesn't depend on who sells what for dollars. Yeah, it affects exchange rates a little bit and, um, and interest rates with the price of gold. But he said the money always, it can't literally disappear. It has to go back into the system. It's a closed circuit. And of course, that's how the euro dollar system works. We're in a recession. I mean, it's not coming. We're in it. It's a triple greatest bubble of all time times three in the sense that it's um, real estate, stocks, and, and other asset classes. The largest, most sophisticated, biggest player, real money market in the world is telling you that the Fed's going to blink, that they're going to raise rates, but then things are going to get so bad, they're going to have to cut rates. And that's why we can see a liquidity crisis and a very severe recession coming well in advance. I haven't really seen the real, the, the market collapse, stock market collapse that I would expect in association with a severe recession has not happened yet. This is just going to play out. It'll get worse as the year goes on. Inflation was going up long before the war in Ukraine started. So you, if everything is great until February 27th and then Russia invades and then all of a sudden inflation goes up. All right, let's talk about it. But that's not true. This, this inflation goes back to uh, late 2021. It was persistent in the fall. We all remember the Fed and the Treasury saying transitory, transitory, transitory. And then finally, I think Jay Powell was testifying for Congress. He said, it's time to retire the word transitory. So that was his way of throwing in the towel. And Johnny Yellen admitted she was mistaken also. This is going to be part of what throws the economy into severe recession. They're raising rates and inflation is coming down. But what they don't know is, are interest rates coming down because they're raising rates? Or have they already hit the terminal rate and it's coming down on its own and they just don't know it? And that's a big deal because if they're at the terminal rate and they just don't know it and they keep tightening, which they are, they are going to over tighten, probably already have it. The energy prices are going up because there's a war with Russia. Well, uh, I wonder why that is. Well, the reason 
uh, is not because Putin invaded Ukraine, it's because the U.S. counterattacked with financial sanctions. Now, bear in mind, go, go back to January 21st, 2021, when Biden was sworn in as president and then went back to the White House. What was the first thing he did? He closed the Keystone XL pipeline. This is a pipeline that would bring oil from Alberta, Canada into the United States, where we connect at a hub, uh, I believe it's in Kansas, but you know somewhere in the central United States. And then the hub distributes it to the entire country. So he shut down that pipeline, uh, which curtailed the supply of oil from Canada. And then we end up with oil prices doubling or tripling, really from $40 to $120 in, in under a year. The other source of inflation is on the demand side. So you have what's called cost push inflation. That's where you know supplies choked off, or there's an embargo, or there's a shortage, of natural disaster, a lot of things. It's coming from the supply side, and demand is inelastic, so you just pay up or you know kind of do without. Um, but the demand side is much more psychological. That's called uh, demand pull inflation. That's when consumers behave the way I described, and as I said, I lived through the 70s, um, where, you know, hey, I better buy it today, I better buy it now. You're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse. So inflation is coming down, no question. But is it because the Fed has continued to raise rates or is it because the Fed has hit a terminal rate and all they have to do is nothing, just pause, as they put it, and inflation will come down where they want. Uh, the market believes we're at the terminal rate. The Fed should just stop right now, leave it alone, sooner than later pivot to, uh, that's the new buzzword, pivot to rate cuts. And it's the anticipation of those rate cuts that has Wall Street all spun up. They get the pom-poms out and saying, buy stocks, buy tech, because the Fed's going to cut rates. The Fed does not see it that way at all. Um, the Fed says, um, yeah, we're raising rates, inflation's coming down, but we're not at the terminal rate. We'll kind of know when we see it, but they think it's probably five and a quarter. That's a very good estimate based on what the Fed has said themselves. I started my career uh, in banking in 1976. And uh, so I started, I remember my, uh, my wife and I used to kid each other. She was in advertising, I was in banking, and the inflation was so bad, you'd get a raise every like four or five months. And you didn't have to ask, they would just give it to you because they knew that you were gonna quit if, if, if uh, they didn't keep up. So she would get a raise and she was making more than I was at the time. So we'd go out to dinner and then I would get a raise and I was making more than she was. So we would just tease each other about that. But that's how it was. Um, and the psychology was, you know, if you needed a whatever, you know, TV set or refrigerator, new car, whatever, you say, I better buy it now because the price is gonna be higher. If I wait a month or two months, the price is gonna run away from me. So it, it had huge behavioral uh, effects between 77 and 81, so that five year period, the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power, not 15, 50. During the first part of the Great Depression, you know, unemployment was high, uh, output was dropping, trade was dropping. It was a very, very bad time, no doubt about it. But not everybody was out of work. Not everybody was poor. There were a lot of people with a lot of money uh, at the time, but it was felt that being ostentatious was poor form. It's like, you know, okay, I'm lucky I have a job, I've got some money, but I'm not gonna buy a new car, or buy a big house or flash it around or whatever, because it's really not considerate of all the people who actually are have fallen on hard times. Well, that was the narrative, but it's the worst possible economic advice because it's precisely the fact that people with the money should keep spending that kind of can boost the economy out of the depression. So by people saying, well, even though I have the money, I'm not going to spend it because it's poor form, uh, we're actually prolonging the Great Depression. Today, we are starting with the cost push inflation, and mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course, they're related. You know, it's like, oh, it's like here's the energy, here's the food. You know, where do you think the food comes from? You To get the food, you got to feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. Oh, how do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel in your tractors. Uh, you get the food. You got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That requires diesel, the higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, et cetera. So these things, as I say, are linked. Um, but, but food prices are going up substantially. And you can't, the two things you can't do without are gas in the car and food. So, so you have that, um, that, that cost push inflation. We're not quite at the stage where it's demand pull. We're not quite at the stage where 
individual consumers are behaving the way I described in the 1970s, saying, hey, better, better spend the money fast because it's, it's losing value. This damage was self-inflicted, but don't be misled by the headlines because they're, again, this narrative, but they're, they're not actually uh, doing it. So the point being, the price increase and inflation in the U.S. has very little to do with Putin and everything to do with the U.S. handicapping its own energy industry, um, begging dictators for oil, uh, and the influence of the climate alarmists. And by the way, that whole crowd uh, want higher gas prices. They want gas to be seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon because they expect that that will accelerate the transfer to electric vehicles and make the electric vehicle more attractive relative to the internal combustion engine. Now that's another fantasy. It will never happen. But meanwhile, they're destroying the US economy in pursuit of an ideological point that will never actually happen. It's going to get worse. Inflation is here to stay. Um, commodities are going to boom. Oil prices are going to soar. Bonds are going to crash. And gold has been in a very funny situation, which is the following. Normally, you say, well, if there's inflation coming, why isn't the price of gold going to the moon? And why on earth would gold prices go up if there were deflation or disinflation? The answer is that you have to look at the yield of maturity on the 10-year Treasury note. That's our benchmark security. Um, a lot of people look at LIBOR, but I'm like, no, if you're making investment decisions, you're buying a house, you're doing capital investing, these are all five, 10, sometimes 20 year decisions. The 10 year note is the right benchmark for those large long-term investments. Um, well, that's an alternative for August of 2020 is as the yield to maturity on the 10 year note goes up, it, that strengthens the dollar and gold prices have gone down because the dollar price of gold is just another cross rate, just another cross exchange rate. So a stronger dollar means a lower dollar price for gold. But if the yield of maturity in the 10 year note goes down, then that weakens the dollar and the dollar price of gold goes up because a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. So curiously, the price of gold is being driven not by inflation in the abstract, but by the strength of the dollar, which is reciprocal to the interest rate on the 10-year treasury notes. But here's what has changed. I talk about gold bull markets and gold bear markets, and I start my analysis in 1971, and I don't have to go through all, all that data, but that's, that's how I think about it. And you're like, well, Jim, why 1971? Why not before that? And of course, 1971, it was when Nixon stopped redeeming dollars for gold. Americans couldn't even own gold in 1971. It was contraband. It was like drugs or you know machine guns or something. But foreign trading partners could redeem dollars for gold up until 1971. And then Nixon said no more. And then that was the final decoupling. But prior to that, gold was actually money. In other words, uh, with under Bretton Woods, gold was pegged at $35 an ounce. Prior to Bretton Woods, it was pegged at $20.67 an ounce. We've gone back to the 1920s or earlier through most of the 19th century. For the United States and sterling, I think it was 475. It could be off a little bit on that, but you know, four four pounds and and change. And as late as World War One, say 1913, if you were a Brit and you were getting on the steamer from London to, you know, at the time Bombay, today Mumbai, you took a purse of uh, British sovereigns. British sovereign is is about uh, about eight grams, a little bit less. You know, it's not an ounce; it's a quarter ounce because an ounce is almost too much. Even even today. What are you going to do with a one ounce coin that's worth, you know, almost $2,000? Uh, you know, you're not going to use that for to buy a pack of gum. But in the day, there was the quarter ounce, which today would be, you know, like a $500 bill. So it's still a significant amount of money. Uh, but you could get on the steamer in Southampton and get off in Bombay at the time. And it was money good. You could take that British sovereign and spend it anywhere. And same thing in Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan or all around the world. So gold was actually money. So it wasn't a question of, oh, what's the exchange rate? It was, the gold was the money and people thought about it by weight. They said, oh, a sovereign, that's eight grams of gold. So that's worth, you know, that'll get you whatever. So, uh, and that was true throughout history. And so it's really only since 1971, when we decoupled completely in terms of an exchange rate that you have to think about, you know, well, what's the dollar price of gold? Because it's not fixed. But okay, well, what happened to the memory? What happened to the 3,000 years I just talked about? Well, the answer is it happened in stages and it actually took 
It took about 75 years. So it began in 1914. 1914 was the outbreak of World War I. Everybody needed gold. There was a, there was a run on gold um, and countries needed gold because they knew they would need gold to pay for the war to try to win the war. Well, it didn't matter if you're Germany, UK or whoever. And remember, the United States was neutral. The United States did not get in the war until 1917. The war started in 1914. So for those first two and a half years, New York was a money center to all of Europe, to, to all the belligerents. Uh, so everyone scrambled for gold. So if you were a citizen, they asked you to bring your gold to the bank and they gave you paper money. And but people did it out of a patriotic, it's existential. War is not a normal market. You're gonna, if you lose the war, you got bigger problems than your gold. And so people put the gold in the banks. What did the banks do? They melted it down and made 400 ounce bars. And they said, don't worry, your money's backed by the gold, but keep using that paper money, uh, but it's redeemable for gold. But oh, by the way, they're 400 ounce bars. Nobody walks around with a 400 ounce bar in her purse. I'm sure you've seen one and I have as well. They're they're heavy, they weigh about 35 pounds. You don't walk around with them. So all of a sudden the, the gold was still there and the paper money was backed by gold in theory, but the gold had disappeared into the banks. That's step one. Step two, and this happened in the 1930s, the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. So first the commercial banks took the gold from the people. Then the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks and the Federal Reserve System sold all the banks. Hey, send your, send your gold to the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, most of it went to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So now it's not even in the banks anymore, right? But you're still walking around thinking your paper money is somehow attached to gold, but people haven't seen gold for a while, uh, unless you're a collector. Step three, uh, the United States Treasury and the finance ministries took it from the central bank. The 1934, the United, the United States Treasury seized the gold of the Federal Reserve System. Bearing in mind, the Federal Reserve System is privately owned. And they gave them a gold certificate. And you go to the Federal Reserve System website today and you know hunt around a little bit on the links and find the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and it's there. And look on the, look in the assets and the first line item is gold certificate, and it's valued at $11 billion. But that's because they value the gold at $42 an ounce. If you, and I've revalued it, the answer is that today's market, that that 11 billion is actually worth 470 billion. So the Fed has a hidden asset of 450 odd billion that's not on the balance sheet, represented by a gold certificate. But it's not the gold, the treasury has the gold, and by the way, where do we keep our gold? I'm talking about the United States. The Treasury owns the gold. The Fed has a paper certificate. The gold is on two Army bases, West Point and Fort Knox. So I would say the Army has the gold. Gold has gone from citizens walking around having it in, in your purse to commercial banks, to central banks, to finance ministries held on an Army base. It's still there. The gold didn't disappear, um, but nobody talks about it. And everyone pretends it's not money, but of course it's money. Um, but but meanwhile, what's happened to this, the, the civilian population, the citizens? We stopped talking about it. We stopped saying it. We stopped learning about it. I remind people, I, you know, just showing my age, but my I got a graduate degree in international economics and I was class of 74. But that was the year the IMF demonetized gold. But I was the last class that was taught gold in an academic setting as a monetary asset. Uh, if you know if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they just stopped teaching it. So now we have two generations of scholars who never learned a thing about gold. So they they hid it, they took it, they buried it, they stopped teaching it, they stopped talking about it, and they pretended it's not there. Meanwhile, it is there. And Russia is a good example of someone who takes it seriously. In the U.S., we still have our 8,000 tons, 8,133 tons. We haven't given it away. We haven't sold any gold since 1980, by the way. We got the British to do it. We got everyone else to do our dirty work. The British sold more than half, no, seriously, the British sold more than half their gold. The Swiss sold a thousand tons. The IMF sold uh, 400 tons in 2010. That was the last significant sell by a, a, you know, a monetary institution. Uh, Australia sold most of theirs. Canada sold most of theirs. Uh, if I were one of these other countries, I would say to the U.S., hey, why don't you sell some of your gold? But the U.S. doesn't. We haven't sold it an ounce since 1980. You know, we got through 1998, we got through the dot-com crash, we got through 2008, we got through 2020 and COVID. 
Uh, there was a, actually a good size uh, market drawdown in 2018 between October 1st, 2018 uh, and Christmas Eve, what I call the Christmas Eve massacre. Stock markets dropped 20% in, uh, in under three months uh, when the Fed kept raising interest rates, even though the economy was weakening. So they have seen those, but every single time it came back, even in COVID, uh, March, April, 2020, the stock market went down 30%. It did, I mean, just almost straight down. But by September, we were back to new all-time highs. And so it's not that they've never seen that kind of volatility, but they learned the wrong lesson, which is it always comes back. And we know why, because the Fed bails you out, the Fed floods the zone with money, the Fed talks it up, you know, et cetera. But the, the counter example, 1929, when the stock market did crash, it was down 23% over two days. It was like a 12% day and an 11% day in uh, late October, 1929 but it kept going. <laughs> the stock market crashed in October, 1929, but it bottomed in June, 1932. That was a three year moving crash or rolling crash, whatever you want to call it, with some rallies along the way. And the total uh, damage was over 80%, not 30%, not 40%, down 80%. And what people don't know, uh, many people don't know, is you said, okay, you know, then, it, then it rallied in 1933 and 1934. The Fed messed up again and blundered again, as they usually do in 1937, and threw us into a double dip. But if you ask people, okay, well, everyone knows the stock market crashed in 1929. When did it regain those highs? How long did that take? The answer is 25 years. It was 1954 before right. the market recovered from 1929. Now, it doesn't mean there weren't gains along the way or you couldn't make money, you could. But if you say, oh, I'll just sit tight and wait till it comes back. Well, a lot of people didn't live long enough. They never saw their, their money back because they didn't live 25 more years. So that's a real bear market. It's happened before. And the, the point is uh, you need to be prepared for things like that. And there are no one alive, but very few people alive have have seen anything like that. And if you say, well, what if we had another market crash right now? We'll talk about reasons why in a second. Um, why could the Fed just come right back in and you know print some more money and do the same thing over again and bail out the new failures, whoever they may be? Yeah, you, know, you can just kind of keep bailing things out. Why not do it again? You know, what's the what's the big deal? Well, the answer is each bailout is bigger than the one before. And that's the point. You can go all the way back 1994, Mexico, 1998, Russia, LTCM, 2000, dot com, 2008, Lehman, 2020, pandemic. And they do bail out, but each one's bigger than the one before. I mean, we threw out six or seven trillion dollars of new debt on top of a one trillion dollar a year baseline, seven trillion dollars in new debt to kind of dig our way out of uh, of 2020. So there is a there is a limit. There comes a time it's like, hey, this this bail is going to be 20 trillion you know sorry that's uh, that check's too big we're gonna have to let some things fail so what could happen um the the first thing on my list is uh we're heading for a very uh severe recession i just want to uh, kind of explain briefly the dynamics of that so the fed's raising interest rates we know that they started you know it, so it wasn't that long ago but march 1st 2022 the fed policy rate was zero it was zero percent uh, people remember Paul Volcker. Oh, Paul Volcker raised interest rates to 20%. Well, he did, but so far Powell hasn't raised them as high, but he's raised them fast. I mean, even when Volcker was working his way to 20%, it took three years from 1979 to 1982. So Powell's plan is clear because he's told us. He said inflation is job one. You know, it's not that we don't care, but unemployment is going to go up. We're going to have a recession. He doesn't use the R word, by the way, but it's implicit in everything he says. We are going to have a recession. Unemployment is going up. And too bad. It's kind of too bad because we got to get inflation under control. And so the Fed is in search of something that they call the terminal rate. What's the terminal rate? The terminal rate is a rate that's high enough to bring inflation down on its own without further hikes. So it doesn't have to be higher than inflation. It has to be high enough to cause inflation to come down to the Fed's goal of 2% without hiking more. And when they get there to that terminal rate, they'll sit tight, they call it the pause. And the pause could be a year. And Powell said this, again, this is right out of his script. So um, Powell's in search of the terminal rate. By the way, if you said to me, hey Jim, what's the terminal rate? I would answer truthfully, I would say, I don't know, but now they're just Jay Powell. Jay Powell doesn't know what the terminal rate is. He's, he's kind of saying, we'll know it when we see it, but we're not there yet and we're gonna keep going. 
And um, they, they have what they call the DOTS, silly name, but the members of the Board of Governors and the Federal Reserve Bank presidents give estimates or, the, you know, their estimates of unemployment, inflation, growth and interest rates for the next three years. Uh, and they put them as dots on a chart, so they call it the dots. Uh, and then, you know, Wall Street gets the dots, they do a central tendency and regressions and all this stuff. One of the top Fed insiders, like practically sits in Jay Powell's lap and has all the way back to Bernanke and Yellen, told me personally, he said, inside the Fed, they regard the dots as a joke. They're not better than guesses. Their forecasting ability is dismal. You or I would have better forecasts. And they wish they could get out of it, but they don't know how. So that's the truth, but the problem is, Wall Street and the financial media and the talking heads on CNBC, they want to talk about the dots and it does affect market behavior. So even though it's a joke, even though the forecasts are terrible, you have to pay attention because it affects the markets. And if you're affecting the markets, you're on the wrong side, you're going to get run over. So I look at the dots, not because I put weight on them as predictive analytic tools, but because the market pays attention. The market says, hey, inflation is already coming down. And so the market says, hey, you did it. You're, you know, you're already there. Inflation is coming down. Why don't you stop? And by the way, you're going to get the message. The economy is going to be slowing down. Inflation is going to be coming down. And then you're going to cut rates. This is the famous pivot. Whenever you hear of the Fed pivot, that's when the Fed turns around and starts cutting rates instead of raising them. And that'll be just in time and growth will slow, but it won't be too bad. And we'll come in for soft landing. And this is the Goldilocks scenario. Uh, so again, typical Wall Street, get the pom-poms out, the Fed's going to cut rates, and so buy stocks. That's all Wall Street knows is buy stocks. But the conundrum is, is inflation coming down because the Fed is still hiking, or is inflation coming down because they're at the terminal rate? Well, we don't know. It's kind of hard to sort those things out. Powell would say, yeah, it's coming down. I know that, of course, but I got it's, it's because I'm hiking and I'm going to keep doing it. My view is, no, you're, you actually did it. It's mission accomplished. You just don't know it. That means, as usual, they're going to screw it up. They're going to blunder. They're going to go too far. And it's not going to be a mild recession. It's not going to be Goldilocks. In this version, Goldilocks gets eaten by the bears. In other words, you're going to throw this economy into a very deep recession because you're going to go too far, as usual. And you're not going to know it until too, too late. By the time you realize You've, it's mission accomplished, you will have gone too far, too long, rates are going to be too high, and it's not going to be a soft landing. If Wall Street's talking up the stock market based on the soft landing Goldilocks scenario, but Powell's going to stick to his guns and, and, and raise rates too high, that's going to cause stocks to crash very severely, very suddenly. If, if the market were adjusting, say, yeah, Powell means it, uh, he's going to keep, man, we ought to come down a little bit, that would be one thing, but that's not what's happening. The market's trying to rally, Powell's warning people what's going to happen. They're not listening and it is going to happen. I'd rather be the U.S. than China. China's in even worse shape for different reasons. Um, it's not so much interest rate policy, although they're they're subject to global interest rate policy and exchange rates coming from the Fed. But uh, you can see it in real estate. It's a full scale collapse. Uh, they're they're propping it up, but um, the, the the buyers aren't interested. In other words, the the Chinese government is telling the banks to lend money to real estate developers who can't finish housing. Well, that sounds good. It's like okay, here's some money, finish the housing. But the buyers are not flocking in. The buyers have been burned. They're shying away from that asset class. They want to increase cash. They're looking at other asset classes. They don't have a lot of choices because. China has very strict capital controls. They're trying to get their money out by means legal and illegal. Uh, they're buying gold when they can. Um, but uh, as I say, they may not have a lot of choices, but even money in the bank looks pretty good compared to what's going on in real estate. The problem is too big. The bubble is too large. It's gone on for too long. We don't hear about it the same way we did about the Japanese real estate bubble in 1989, 1990. That was an epic crash. Uh, Japan is still not recovered. I remember in the 90s, Early 2000s, they talked about the lost decade. Well, try three lost decades. That's going into a fourth. Uh, that's Japan, you know, eight or I've lost count, actually, eight or nine recessions since 1989. But it's really just one long depression. That's the way to understand the Japanese economy. China's going into something like that. We don't hear much about it because they're not transparent. They lie about their numbers. You, you need to look at private sources and other use other, other analytic tools to understand what's going on there. Uh, but they've got um, you know, drops in consumption, industrial output, 
real estate's collapsing, uh, their price indices are collapsing, all this infl- fear of inflation. It's been around, it's real, but it's now turning around very quickly. And you can see that in China. China's gone through something that the world has never seen. Uh, it is a, they're going to lose 600 million people in the next 50 to 70 years. This is a demographic implosion. This is worse than the Black Death. Of course, the Black Death uh, killed somewhere between a third and half the population of Europe in the uh, 14th century. Um, uh, it was a good time for uh, for labor, by the way. Uh, the you know the labor was so scarce that returns to labor went up versus returns to capital uh, because there weren't enough workers. Uh, but that's the only thing uh, that can come close. Even the uh, you know the Spanish flu of 1919 killed about no no one's certain of the number, but but between 100 million and maybe over 200 million people. The Thirty Years' War was certainly you know in the early 17th century was certainly highly destructive. But what's going on in China now is is worse than any of those things. Um, it, you know has to do with math, you know simple demographic math. Uh, the key number is 2.1. Two people have to produce 2.1 children, you know, man and woman, or you can say per woman if you if you want, uh, have to produce 2.1 children to keep the population constant. Why not two? Why not two producing two? The answer is infant mortality and those who don't make it to uh, adulthood and can continue the uh, repopulation of the planet, uh, if you will. But they're not even close to that. They're well below two. And by the way, so is so is the rest of the world. So is Australia and the US and Western Europe and a lot of other places. This is a global phenomenon, but it's particularly acute in China. Maybe the case that China's uh replacement rate is uh or or birth rate is actually one. Uh it has to be two point one to maintain. It could be one or lower. Uh this is a, a demographic implosion unlike anything ever seen uh, anyone's ever seen. It also has a dynamic. You can't reverse it very quickly. It, it feeds on itself as I was talking about inflation earlier. So uh, this is going to continue for 50 to 75 years. Uh, they're going to lose 600 million people. There are a lot of definitions of GDP, a four or five part definition. They're more complex calculations, but there's one really simple definition. It only has two factors, population and productivity. How many people are working and how productive are they? That's nominal GDP. It's, that's one definition of gross GDP uh, or, or nominal uh, GDP. Well, if your population is dropping from 1.4 billion to 800 million, you're losing 600 million people. Uh, and then what about productivity? Well, the other thing that's going on is China's population is aging very quickly. So you get a population set people in the 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, with very large amounts of um, cognitive decline, dementia. Uh, obviously there's no productivity there, but it's worse than that because then you look at the shrinking population between the ages of 25 and 54, it's called their prime working age. More and more of those people are going to have to be involved in elder care. They're going to have to be basically caretakers or caregivers for the older population I described. A very worthy job, but not one that lends itself to productivity gains. Um, bathing hasn't changed in about 5,000 years. Robots don't do best. Um, the only real innovation in bathing in uh, between 1870 and 1940, we did see the rise of indoor plumbing and hot water. That's good. Um, I, I enjoy both, but, um, but that's it. We, I can't think of any other bathing innovations, uh, in, in the last several millennia. So if you have a shrinking working age population, a rising older population, high degree of cognitive decline and a big slice of the working age population having to provide elder care or be caregivers for the older population. Tell me where your industrial output's coming from. Tell me where your productivity is coming from. And uh, sorry if I mentioned this already, but 50% of the water in China is poisoned uh, because of, you know, just their industrial practices. You know, they, they uh, if you're a gold miner in Australia, I invest in gold mines around the world. I know that places like Canada, the U S and uh, Australia, if you use cyanide, to leach the gold, and that's a very common technique. You have to account for every, you know, microgram. You, you know, whatever you put in, you got to take out, weigh it, dispose of it properly. In China, they just dump it into the rivers, and so the rivers are poison. Um, so China is uh, uh, an economic, demographic, industrial, moral, religious uh, wasteland, and uh, will suffer. It's it's already in a recession. Just to just to cut to the chase. Again, they lie about their statistics. So, so here you have the two largest economies in the world, U.S. and China. U.S. is slowly going into what I expect will be a severe recession. China is in a century-long 
decline, uh, unlike one that the world has ever seen, um, that could eventually lead to social unrest and regime change. But let's not count on that in the short run. Just expect China to um, to shrink and become more autarkic, decoupled from the Western world, and uh, certainly not be a, a source of growth. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, the largest and most sophisticated semiconductor manufacturing in the world. And semiconductors are in everything. It's not just computers. There are 1,400 semiconductors in an automobile. Uh, there's a semiconductor or more in your, your dishwasher, your refrigerator, your washing machine. They're everywhere. Internet of things. We all understand that. Um, so TSMC based in Taiwan. Uh, the United States has a military doctrine called the broken nest theory. And what it says is that if China, well, it comes from a Chinese proverb, ironically, and it says, if the nest is broken, how can the eggs survive? Um, and what it means is that if China invades Taiwan, and I'm not forecasting an invasion, could happen though, um, we or the Taiwanese will very quickly destroy all the semiconductor manufacturers in Taiwan. We'll just blow them up. And China won't get anything. They'll have the broken nest. Taiwan Semiconductor knows this. Um, they talk to the U.S. intelligence and military. Global economy is is the big topic. That's what we all care about most. But financial markets can come up with their own narratives and go their own way, at least for a while. So you have to, they're not in, in sync. They, they do, they will be in sync eventually, but uh, not always right away. A lot of times the financial markets get ahead of themselves and then they wake up to reality and they, oh, crash you know, correct down so there's a little bit of that going on but in terms of the global economy um i think your use of the word global is very much on point because we are going into or may already be in a global recession now that's rare it's it's rare when hey, china japan u.s germany they're all in recession at the same time but that's what's unfolding that's a big deal uh well for obvious reasons uh because uh, you know it affects uh, basically everyone but um there's no life preserver there's no you know it's not like china's going to pull us all out of it with cheap exports or or japan's going to you know put the pedal to the metal in terms of fixed uh asset investment uh you know etc so so that's a really bad sign i mean and just to be very specific you know we just saw u.s Fourth quarter GDP grew at a 2.9 percent annualized rate. People are like, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, and you know, it's not good by post 1980 standards. It's not good at all by post World War II standards. But post 2008, yeah, that's not that's not bad. Uh, again, you have to disaggregate it and you look at what grew. It was uh, inventories were a big contributor, uh, and net exports were a big contributor, um, and a fi fixed asset investment in particular. There was a big load of um, uh, aircraft orders for Boeing, which is notoriously lumpy. You know, they, they'll have a big month, blowout month, and then nothing for a couple of months, not nothing, but, you know, something very low. So when you look at that, uh, inventories are counted as part of GDP, of course, but it's not necessarily a good thing. If inventories are piling up, it means retailers are not buying. And this kind of goes back to the whole supply chain breakdown of a year ago. That's what my book sold out was about. So you go back to, uh, let's say, the spring of 2022. The supply chain had completely fallen apart. And if you were a purchasing manager and you were, you were saying to yourself, um, okay, we're kind of coming out of COVID. We're, we're, we're going to start growing. Uh, but the supply chain is broken. So instead of ordering one, you know, container, I'm going to order three containers because maybe one will get through, you know, through the bottlenecks. I only want one, but I'm going to order three and hope for the best. What happened was some of that, a lot of the stuff was alleviated, not for good reasons, not really for logistical reasons, but because the consumers slowed down a lot beginning in June, partly in reaction to the Fed starting to hike rates in March of uh, 2022. Uh, and then here come the three containers. So at this, at the, at the exact moment when uh, demand destruction is kicking in, your inventory is going to the rafters. So what do retailers do or wholesalers for that matter? But retail, they slash prices that, you know, two for one sales, uh, you know, because inventories are a nightmare for retailers for obvious reasons. Number one, you have to finance them. So they eat up working capital. It could be cash, but now you know, you got a bunch of stuff in the back office. And number two, it just takes up space. I mean, it, it insurance costs and, and other costs like that. But the other thing people kind of underestimate is that like style, uh, fashion goes, stuff goes out of fashion. You know, the, the last spring's styles are not next spring styles. You still got last spring stuff. Good luck. You know, it's, it, we're getting close to spring. So you're dumping that stuff 
um, you know, consumer electronics, uh, you know, you got an iPhone 13, well, everybody wants an iPhone 14, you know, whatever. I mean, you take the point. So, um, so piling up inventories is a very unhealthy sign. It means the retail sector is drying up, demand destruction is kicking in, costs are going up because you got to finance all this stuff and your profit margins are going down. So I don't take a lot of comfort from that. But the other thing, to the extent you can disaggregate monthly data, and there's a lot of monthly data, yeah, 2.9% annualized for the quarter, but it really slowed down in December. Christmas was a disaster. I mean, yeah, people bought stuff for Christmas, but way below expectations. And again, it goes back to piling up the inventory at the worst possible time. So it looks like the U.S. is going into 2023 Possibly recession started in December. If not, we expect it to start soon. But you're seeing the same thing in Europe now. Europe got a break with the weather. Uh, you know, obviously there's a war going on, so that's a big factor. But, um, uh, you know, and natural gas prices, uh, skyrocketed and, uh, and, and oil prices skyrocketed, um, again in mid, uh, 2022. They've come down, but it doesn't mean that, you know, all is well or, or they're out of the woods and there are, there are other things going on. China is a basket case. Um, you know, they went from zero COVID. It was bad public policy and bad health policy. But they did it anyway. So they flipped almost on a dime. So they just turned on a dime and said, okay, let it rip. The, the positive letter, okay, let everyone get infected and we'll do the best we can. One of the ways you get through it is by letting rip and you develop what's called herd immunity. And that's what worked in North America and Europe. But the other difference with, between China and Europe and, and the U.S. is that they don't have the healthcare system to deal with it. Our healthcare system, which is pretty good, was strained. Same thing in Europe. China has nowhere near the ICU unit, the ICU units, the oxygen, the treatments, uh, the, just the, the professionals, the nurses and doctors, not even close. And when you get out to the village level, which is where most of the people still live, believe it or not, um, they, uh, they often have nothing. But that is hurting the economy as much as the zero COVID. They're, they're, they had no good ways out. I'm not saying one's better than the other. They're both awful, but, uh, but you still have a lot of things that are not COVID. The real estate collapse, the excessive debt, the demographic decline, um, just the impact of top down management where you can't possibly get everything right, you know, and so, and decoupling from the U.S. and the U.S. cutting off, um, you know, high tech exports to China, including their country exports where they're relying on U.S. licenses or equipment. So China's in a deep hole, probably in a recession. Japan, same thing. So, so the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that, um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal, but they're expecting a mild recession. And I see a much more severe recession. Now, the other half, what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a, an, an Irish pub and you got three Irish storytellers. And I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and, uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality. What's actually happening? Uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks, bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. And then, uh, there's what I call the reality. Uh, and I guess I'm a storyteller here, but, um, what I see is, is a kind of a hybrid. The Fed's doing what they're doing, right or wrong. Okay. They're, they're doing what they're doing. The market has their own interpretation. I agree with the market, certainly the bond market, that the Fed has probably over tightened. They probably are at the, um, so-called terminal rate. They just don't know it. They're going to keep going for the reasons I explained. That means they're going to make it worse. They're going to make the recession even worse. Um, and they may pivot uh, to say that there could be a rate cut. Um, it won't be in April, but, you know, rate cut in August, maybe. I wouldn't rule that out. But for a really bad reason. In other words, if the Fed cuts rates, which they may, the pivot may be real. It's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up, as usual, as they've been doing since 1913, they over tightened and they found out too late. And then they got to, then they have to slam on the brakes if, or take the foot off the brake, if you will, in terms of rate hikes and then pivot. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it was like 19.9 or something on the Dow. So maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened 
on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre and after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh, they don't care that much about this. The supply chain was breaking down before COVID. Now, of course, COVID made it worse. Yes. Uh, and the war in Ukraine made it worse. Yes. But this really started with Trump's trade war in 2018. That, like I said, there's a thread that runs through all these things. So not to throw out my hands, I'm not going to do that. But when you ask me that, I'm like, I'm thinking, well, you want to talk about China, Ukraine, supply chain, Biden, they're all a big deal. You know, in terms of tragedy, probably the war in Ukraine is the most important because it's highly, highly significant economically and strategically. But of course, it's a human tragedy going with it. You know, if Chinese real estate implodes. Okay, there's some hardship here and there, but it's not like people being killed or main or forced into refugee status. And that is part of what's going on in Ukraine. So that's a that's probably the biggest single one, but I wouldn't miss the fact that all these things are going on at once. The number one question, uh, of course, everyone's concerned about inflation, but there's a big backstory there. But I always say when it comes to your own money, everybody has a PhD in economics. You don't need Larry Summers to tell you what's going on with your budget and your you know, ability to feed your family or keep a roof over your head. So people get inflation. One of the reasons it's so politically toxic is because it's unavoidable. You can't fudge it. You can't spin it. It's like, hey, if I used to fill up my Ford F-150 truck for 50 bucks, and now it's 125 bucks, A, you get it. It's right in your face. And B, that's 75 bucks that you don't have. To take your spouse out to dinner, you know, buy a new jacket or whatever. So there's kind of demand destruction at the same time you're spending more money on the one thing you can't do without. So people get it. But then from there, the question I get the most is, hey, Jim, is this going to cause a recession? Are we going to have a recession? And as recently as a few months ago, I would say, yeah, I think so. You can see it coming late this year, early next year. Now I say we're in a recession. I mean, it's not coming. We're in it. And there's data. I, you know, I never make statements like that, Brian, without supporting it. So the standard definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. There are a few more bells and whistles having to do with unemployment and a few other things, but that's the rule of thumb. So based on that, based on the best available estimate for a second quarter, likely to be accurate, we're in a recession today. Now, it's not severe, but that's like saying, I got, I'm in bed with a, you know, pneumonia, but I'm not dying. Well, okay, but uh, we're in a recession right now. Um, and there's a lot of whistling past the graveyard. I mean, the stock market is still you know, greatly overpriced. There's still, you know, the buy the dips mentality hasn't gone away. It's still there. You got people like Jim Cramer yelling, you know, buy Netflix or whatever. And, uh, you know, there's institutional support. There's momentum trading. Of course, 95% of the trading is by robots. So you got to reverse engineer the 27 year olds from Bangladesh who don't get out much. So they're the ones really writing these algorithms. Uh, I mean, brilliant engineers, but, you know, you'd have to show them around Wall Street. So all that's going on. So we haven't really seen the real, the market collapse, stock market collapse that I would expect in association with a severe recession has not happened yet. This is just going to play out. It'll get worse as the year goes on. All right. So you're expecting a major correction in stock markets on yeah, the back I'm of not a recession. alone. I mean, that is my expectation. I have my own models and I look at it closely. But if you listen to you know, Michael Berry, Jeremy Grantham, uh, you know, Charlie Munger, these people have been around and they run, you know, hundreds of billions and uh, they're saying the same thing. So every now and then someone will throw some statistic at me. And I go, well, how long is your time series? And I go, oh, we took it back five years. I was like, you know, talk to me if you've done it for a hundred years, because that's a little more meaningful. But Jeremy Grantham actually did do a 100 year time series and looked at bubbles all over the world, you know, 1929, US, 1989, Japan, 2000, dot com stocks, you know, and many others. And he said he's never seen anything like it. You know, it's a triple greatest bubble of all time, times three in the sense that it's real estate, stocks, and other asset classes. So, uh, yeah, I do, that is my view, but it's shared by a number of other analysts. And that would mean like S&P coming off another 20, 30%? Yes. And again, you have to remind people, 
1929, everyone's like, yeah, October, uh, I think uh, 18th or 19th, it was late October 1929, the stock market fell 22% in two days. It wasn't one day, it was, you know, it was like 12% one day, 11% the next day, so 23% over two days. But that wasn't the crash. I mean, that was the beginning of the crash. This Dow Jones fell 82% from top to bottom. Now it took three years. It bottomed in uh, June 1932, started in October 1929, so not quite three years, but that fell 82%. And that happens. So uh, yeah, we're down, uh, you know, NASDAQ's down, uh, bounced back a little bit in recent days, down close to 30%, down the S&P down over 20%. We're in bear market territory, but that's just the beginning. That's not what a full bear market, full, you know, market adjustment looks like in the face of the kind of recession that I expect. Talk to me about inflation, because, you know, I was looking at some of the inflation numbers and you have to go back to the 80s to see anything that's approaching double digit. You know, I remember being just a kid hearing about double digit inflation. I could kind of remember the gas pumps, you know, the lines at the gas. It's like a distant memory of me in the 70s. And but, you know, how do you talk to younger people these days about what inflation is or it means? Because I don't think people really grasp what it actually means to your savings or to the economy in an, even a medium term. Well, that's exactly right, Brian. And if you, um, you're a little younger than I am, but I lived through it. I was started my career in banking in 1976. And I remember my, uh, my wife and I used to kid each other. She was in advertising, I was in banking. And the inflation was so bad, you'd get a raise every like four or five months and you didn't have to ask they would just give it to you because they knew that you were going to quit if they didn't keep up so she would get a raise and she was making more than i was at the time so we'd go out to dinner and, and i would get a raise and i was making more than she was so we would just tease each other about that but that's how it was and the psychology was you know if you needed a whatever you know a tv set or refrigerator new car or whatever you say i better buy it now because the price is going to be higher if i wait a month or two months the price is going to run away from me so it had huge behavioral effects of course gold was you know going to the moon there was a lot going on at the time but brian you're right when you say we're putting up inflation numbers today that are the highest in 40 years that is correct a little 41 actually it was 1981 before we saw these numbers but i remind people the inflation in 1981 was the end of a 10-year period of inflation it wasn't the beginning it's like oh that's some inflation yeah we did but it had started i mean in some ways it started in 1968 and it really took off in 1974-75 so 81 these numbers that was when volcker finally got it under control but you go back to 80 you now 70 we do well between 77 and 81 so that five-year period the dollar lost 50 percent of its purchasing power not 15, 50 in that five year stretch. So you were putting up numbers, you know, 10%, 11%, 13% and higher year after year. Yeah, 1981, it was, um, you know, nine or 10, which is what they're comparing to today. But that was on the downslope. It had been higher than that in 77, 78, and, you know, 79. So the question is, is this the beginning of an inflationary surge where it's going to get even worse and it is going to last five years? Or is it different than that? But keep that in mind because the 40 year comparison, it is correct, but that was the tail end of an even worse episode. And again, there is this comparison to the seventies. By the way, I think the situation we're in today is very different from the 1970s. And I'll explain why. In the seventies, it was triggered from the supply side with first the Arab oil embargo in 1973 as a result of the, uh, the 1973 Arab-Israeli war. And then the price tripled, but it went from like $2 to $6. Okay. But, you know, percentage terms, that's a huge jump, but it was still $6. And then it got to 12. And then in 1979, you had a second oil embargo because of Iran and the Ayatollah and the revolution and the hostages and all that. And then it went from kind of 12 to 20. So oil went up by a factor of 10 in the course of the late 70s because of those two different embargoes. So that's coming from the supply side. But what happened was the other source of inflation is on the demand side. So you have what's called cost push inflation. That's where you know supplies choked off or there's an embargo or there's a shortage, natural disaster, a lot of things. It's coming from the supply side and demand is inelastic. So you just pay up or you know kind of do without. But the demand side is much more psychological. That's called demand pull inflation. That's when consumers 
behave the way I described. And as I said, I lived through the 70s, um, where, you know, hey, I better buy it today, I better buy it now. You're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse. So as that applies to today, we are starting with the cost push inflation, you know, mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course, they're related. You know, it's like, here's the energy, here's the food. You know, where do you think the food comes from? To get the food, you got to feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. Oh, how do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel in your tractors. You get the food. You got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That requires diesel. The higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, et cetera. So these things, as I say, are linked. But food prices are going up substantially. And you can't, the two things you can't do without, like, uh, if you look at yield curves, Look at the treasury yield curve, euro dollar futures yield curve, German bunds yield curve. They're all inverted. They're all inverted. Now, inversions happen, just meaning the longer term rate is lower than the short term rate. We're seeing something globally we've never seen before. And it is the best single indicator of a recession. The last time we saw anything like this was uh, in 2007, uh, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. So the stock market's saying it's all good, Goldilocks, soft landing, Fed's going to get the memo, they're going to cut rates, the pivot, and buy stocks. The bond market is saying, no, this is bad, and it's going to get worse, and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. See, when these inversions start, sometimes they're a year forward, like, hey, look out, look at the euro dollar futures yield curve a year from now, man, that thing is inverted. But what happens is, as you get closer to the actual thing you're worried about, the inversion gets nearer and nearer. Now it is literally a month away or, or, or less. So that's like a, you know, a big red siren, a flashing light, whatever you want to call it. Okay, the, um, you know, whatever your baseline is, probably treasuries, you know, to your notes or five year notes or whatever, they will come down a lot, not right away. It's, it may still be a month or two away from, on this, but they'll come down a lot and then corporate yields will go up a lot because of the recession, because of deterioration, increased bankruptcies, reduced revenues, you know, et cetera. So those spreads will blow out. And it's important to remember, um, interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates be um, going up if we're in a recession? The answer is, as you get close to recession, who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know. Wall Street is second last to know the people who figure it out first are actual business people entrepreneurs restaurant owners dry cleaners taxi drivers um or even medium-sized businesses they see it uh, you know if you're in the trucking business it's it's real time uh you know if inventories are sky high and new orders are being slashed you're not moving anything by truck so there are certain businesses that are concurrent the yield curves i was talking about are very good forward indicators they tell you what's going to happen next a lot of business people are living in the real world in real time. They know what's happening now, and the stock market tends to figure it out later. But as far as banking and credit is concerned, what happens is if you're a business person and you see business heading down, you know, fewer customers, whatever, you go out and borrow all you can. You're like, hey, it's a really bad recession coming. I better, if I got lines of credit, I'm going to use them up now. I don't want my bank changing the term. I said, I'm going to borrow everything I can. And that creates a demand for funds and interest rates go up. And then the recession hits. And the bankers go, huh, what's going on? Credit losses start going up. And then then they just turn off the spigots and they raise standards, they stop doing loans. And then interest rates will start to come down. Interest rates peak after the recession has already begun. So interest rates may not have peaked yet. I mean, you know, even the treasury market. So that's not unusual. Now, here's what the Fed is uh, is missing, or maybe everybody's missing. When you hear these layoff announcements, people are like, well, if they're laying off, why isn't, why isn't the unemployment rate going up? Well, the answer is they have to announce the layoffs. There's all kinds of statutes, you know, SEC. So if I'm going to fire 10,000 people, I got to tell the world I'm firing 10,000 people. It doesn't mean I fired them that day. I might fire them you know, on a rolling basis over the next 30 days. And it doesn't mean they walk out the door empty handed and head for the unemployment office. I might give them three months severance, six months severance, et cetera. And so when do they actually show up to the unemployment office and say, you know, give me a check? It might not be till this spring. So the layoff announcements are out there, but the unemployment rate hasn't budged because there is a lag three months. But that's why I said interest rates uh, lag the business cycle and they do. Unemployment lags the business cycle. Unemployment is a lagging indicator.
When you're an employer, entrepreneur, and you're in any kind of distress, you know, not as many customers walking in the door, you'll do everything you can to avoid laying people off. You'll, you know, be late on the rent, you'll turn down the lights, find a cheaper laundry, whatever it takes. By the time you get around to firing people, you run out of options. Like, oh, I've done everything I can, now my business is in jeopardy, I have to fire some people. And then combine that with what I just said about severance and, you know, rolling terminations, et cetera, it's a lagging indicator. But we know enough right now to know that number's going up, but that's not inconsistent with the fact that we're already in a recession. It's exactly what you would expect, um, that unemployment's a lagging indicator. So when the Fed's on a mission, they, they actually don't care about the stock market. Here's what they do care about. They care about disorderly markets. And that's the key word. It's not if stocks are going down, but it's you know kind of a little, you know, half a percent a day, one percent a day, trending down, lower highs, lower lows, trending down. The Fed doesn't care about that. They're not going to bail out the stock market. They do care if it's disorderly. When was it disorderly? Well, March 2020, at the worst part of the pandemic, it dropped like 30% in like two or three weeks. The fall of 2008, I mean, it was like somebody opened a trap door. The Fed does care about that because that kind of disorderly behavior can feed on itself and end up in a 1929 type scenario. So the Fed will get the memo, as I put it, uh, stop raising rates and begin cuts when the markets are disorderly. That may happen. In fact, I expect it will, but, but we're not there yet. So there may be a pivot, but not because of Goldilocks, but because it's not a soft landing, it's a crash landing. So, so the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that, um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal, but they're expecting a mild recession. I see a much more severe recession. Now, the other half, what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a, an, an Irish pub and you got three Irish storytellers. And I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality, what's actually happening. Uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks, bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. And then uh, there's what I call the reality. Uh, and I guess I'm the storyteller here, but um, what I see is, is a kind of a hybrid. The Fed's doing what they're doing, right or wrong. Okay, they're they're doing what they're doing. The market has their own interpretation. I agree with the market, certainly the bond market, that the Fed has probably over tightened, and they may pivot uh, to say that there could be a rate cut. Maybe I wouldn't rule that out, but for a really bad reason. In other words, if the Fed cuts rates, which they may, the pivot may be real. It's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up as usual as they've been doing since 1913. They over tightened and they found out too late. And then they got to, then they have to slam on the brakes if, or take the foot off the brake, if you will, in terms of rate hikes and then pivot. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it's like 19.9 or something on the Dow, so maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre. And after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh, they don't care that much about the stock market level.